and welcome back to our One Wild and Precious Lives and our dogs. I'm really excited about today's conversation. I'm going to talk to Sue Yanov, a board certified veterinary surgeon who has a special interest in canine sports medicine. And we'll talk about the life quality of free roaming dogs versus pet dogs today, which is a topic that I'm really passionate about. Sue, would you like to introduce yourself and your canine family properly? Okay, I'll start with my dogs first. I have beagles, that is my breed. I do performance sports with my beagles. Um, I have uh, titled beagles in obedience, agility, tracking, and confirmation. Right now I have two beagles. Actually, that's my limit in pet dogs is two. So Ivy, who's 10 years old, is a champion. A mock has her CDX and TD, and we're working on our utility title. Mm -hmm. And Quinn, who just turned three, is being trained in agility and obedience and is one major away from her championship. Yeah, so we do a lot. Uh, but the most important thing is that they are my companions and hiking buddies. If I could do nothing else with them except enjoy their company and go hiking, that would be fine with me too. Yeah. As you said, I'm a veterinarian. I graduated in 1980, so that's a long time ago. And I've done a lot uh, over my career, but the important thing now is that I'm mostly retired. I do a couple of days a week of surgery at local clinics, and I take uh, on-call emergency surgery call once a month uh, okay. at the practice. I used to practice surgery. And for the last 10 years of my career or so, I worked with a, a friend who's also a licensed veterinary technician and a human physical therapist. And we had a uh, pretty active sports medicine practice, but we both decided we're too old to want to work that hard anymore. So now I will occasionally see a dog for a friend and I'll also see dogs for the, our local law enforcement police departments. Oh, nice. uh, if, if they, uh, if they have an, an issue that I can help them with, but mostly I uh, spend time with my dogs and, and working a few days a month. Oh, sounds like you're living the good life. Yeah, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really grateful to have Sue in my life for all kinds of reasons, but in terms of free roaming dogs, because she's someone whose veterinary knowledge I trust and who can help me fact check my opinions. Most of the free roamers I see when I'm walking around wherever I happen to be living in Latin America seem to be in a decent physical condition. But every once in a while, I'll see an injured dog and then I'll get curious. For example, one free roamer, Game and I know well, we used to walk past him most days. And one day I noticed a relatively large wound on his lower back leg. And that made me sad and a little worried because I have a relationship with this dog. Usually goes that Game makes friends with certain free roaming dogs. And then because she's friends with them, I get to be their friend as well. So I wondered what would happen to this dog knowing that he was unlikely to get veterinary attention. I wondered if the wound was going to get infected and if he was going to die a slow and painful death. But I'm not a vet and I have no idea how to judge the severity of the wound. I also wasn't going to interfere either way. This is not my dog. He's someone else's dog. But I did take a picture of the wound and ask Sue for her opinion about his likely future. This was one of those learning moments that I treasure so much. Thank you for this, Sue. So she explained to me that the exposed tissue in the wound looked like granulation tissue. And granulation tissue is resistant to infection. So while the healing process might be very slow, it was unlikely that the wound would get infected, even without daily washing or cleaning or bandaging. And indeed, a few weeks later, the wound was almost closed up. And by now, several months later, you wouldn't be able to tell that it ever was there. This is fascinating to me. I would have rushed my own dog to the vet with this kind of injury. And in this part of the world, they would have given me antibiotics right away. And also I would have put her on restricted activity. I'd be probably cleaning the wound every day and bandaging it and, you know, just spending a lot of time on it. Nobody did that with this dog and he still healed up. It's so interesting to me. And then just last week, I was on a road trip and I saw a free roamer next to a highway who was holding one front leg up so it wouldn't touch the ground. And when he was running, the lower leg just swang back and forth as if he didn't have any control over it. 
So I assumed that this was from an old car accident because of the location right next to that freeway. And also because I could see the dog run out into the street when Game and I walked past on the opposite side of the, the other sidewalk. So he apparently has not learned to avoid the street. So I didn't know this dog, but I wondered if he was in pain and if he would be in pain for the rest of his life, or if he was doing just fine and not in pain, and basically just carrying that weight around while living his best life. And I tend to be suspicious about myself when I think something about a dog that I know is an opinion, and I like challenging my opinions with facts. So my gut feeling said, oh, this dog is not in pain. But because I don't have that education, I'm aware of the fact that I really don't know. And in this situation, there were definitely facts to be found. So I took a video of that dog and Sue to the rescue. I sent her the video of the dog running as he was barking at Game and me. And I asked her if she thought he was in pain. These are all informal conversations, obviously. Sue is not diagnosing anyone here. She's just helping me order my own thoughts. She pointed out to me that the dog in my video looked like he was injured at or just below the elbow joint. That's why he couldn't put weight on the leg because he couldn't extend his elbow. She made me aware of two seconds in the video where it looked like he was extending his carpus, which meant that the nerves to the extensor muscle still worked. I had missed these two seconds before. I hadn't realized he could still extend. And it was likely, since those nerves still work, that the sensory nerves also still work, which meant that he would be in chronic pain and continue being in chronic pain for the rest of his life. And I watched these two seconds of my video, and now I could see them as well, that moment of extension. So with this dog, clearly my initial completely unfactual hunch, which had been that he probably wasn't in pain, that was clearly wrong. That led us to a brief conversation about the life quality of free-roaming dogs versus an average pet dog. Long story short, we want to extend this conversation today. To get us started, we'll just have to define what a free-roaming dog and an average pet actually are. Because maybe we're talking about completely different things when our opinions diverge here. So, speaking of those definitions, I'm sure you've seen many average pet dogs as a veterinarian. What is their life like? What does it mean to be an average pet dog? So I was thinking about this a lot since we decided to have this discussion. And the bottom line is, um, it's really hard to define what an average pet dog is. Uh, and I'll tell you what I think, and then I'll tell you what the outliers are. So in my experience, and, and you know, I've been a veterinarian for 42 years. I've been in private practice. I've been in referral practice. I've been in specialty practice. But when I think of the average pet dog, I think of the people that just come in to the vet clinic on a routine basis once a year or if their pet is sick. And it's a dog that basically is mostly pampered. Um, most of them are overweight and not underweight. Yeah. Uh, most of them don't get as much activity as I think a dog should have because I think of my dogs and, and my dogs are in the category of what I consider performance dogs and they are treated differently. They get more activity, they get more training, but the average pet dog doesn't have a lot of training. Some of them are quite well behaved. Some of them are not very well behaved. Uh, and they just basically uh, have their needs met and, and we can define or discuss what the needs are, but food, clothing, shelter, basically. So they have um, a place to stay indoors, out of the elements. They are well-fed, sometimes too well-fed. Yeah. If they have an injury or an illness, they are taken to the veterinarian. And they basically just live a life where they kind of exist. They, they might go for a walk around the block. They might have a fenced-in yard. Uh, most pet dogs in the United States, at least, are not free-roaming partly because there are laws against it and partly because people don't want to just let their dogs out and worry what's going to happen to them while yeah. they're out there. Animal so control that's, would pick them up, I suppose, right? Mostly. Animal control would pick them up. A, a neighbor might pick them up and call the owner. Some good Samaritan might find them. And if they have identification on their collars, they would call the owner to come get them. So there are options, but free roaming dogs, I mean, there are strays and there are dogs that get lost, but there are not populations of free roaming dogs in most places mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, now I have traveled a lot. And so I have been in places where there are free roaming dogs that I've observed. I'm like you, I have opinions also about yeah. the free roaming dogs that I have observed. What places uh, and then, have you observed them? Uh, places like um, southern Italy, Sicily, I'm thinking of, of a, uh, I spent a week uh, in Sicily at a beach town and there was mm -hmm. a, a group of dogs 
Papua New Guinea and some more rural areas of Australia. Oh, okay. And then also um, I've been in Central America, Panama, mm -hmm. and, and have seen dogs in, actually in Panama City. So, and again, mm -hmm. you know, when you talk about street dogs, there are urban street dogs and country street dogs. And so you can, you can define yeah. the average street dog. That's not my area of expertise yeah. or much experience but I do have a lot of experience with pet dogs and, and yeah, that's yeah. what I think of. And then there are pet dogs that are, do not have good lives that are um, abused, not well taken care of, tied out in the backyard to a chain, are thin and, and they have ectoparasites like fleas and ticks and, and endoparasites like intestinal worms. And, you know, I, I also work at shelters doing spay neuter clinics um, once a month or so. And so I see the shelter population of dogs and I hear about dogs that are brought in as abuse cases. And I hear mm -hmm. about animals that are brought in as part of hoarding where they're not well taken care of. And that's, that's really, it's sad how people handle pets, but I don't consider those average pets. Yeah. So the, the, the super well taken care of dogs are on one end of the spectrum and, and then the misused or abused dogs are at the other end and then everything else is in the middle and that is what I consider an average pet. Yeah I think that's actually a good definition. I was just thinking about this because right before our Zoom call I was walking with game and I thought about how I would define a pet dog and how I would define an average free roaming dog and what really stands out to me about your definition of the average pet dog is that you focus on, on the things that they do get and the things that they do have, the advantages they have in their lives versus I, as I was thinking about it, thought about the disadvantages. So I didn't primarily think about their access, for example, to veterinary care or food. I was thinking more about the lifestyle of their humans. So I was thinking, well, the average pet dog probably is owned by someone or by a family who work eight to 10 hours a day. So that pet dog spends, let's say, maybe five days a week, 10 hours by themselves and maybe created during that time. That's one of the reasons that I have strong opinions or that I like to me, that seems like a welfare issue. It doesn't seem right to be isolated. I'm assuming the average pet dog is just one dog, so they don't have the company of other dogs and kenneling for hours. I feel like that's okay for working dogs because their needs in terms of mental and physical stimulation are being met. So they're happy just sleeping the rest of the time. But I'm assuming the average pet dog just like walks around the block once or twice a day. Their physical and mental needs are maybe not being met. And if your physical and mental needs are not being met, and then you're basically in solitary prison for the rest of the day, that seems horrible to me. Do that as a part of the average pet dog's life as well? Or am I just making things up here? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. I agree with you that being crated for eight or 10 hours a day without a break is not in the best interest of the dog's needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any data on how many dogs are crated yeah. versus left home alone. I would argue, and again, this is an opinion, opinion, that most pet dogs are not crated. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how many households in the U.S. are multi-dog households. I know a lot of them are. I don't have that data. I think it's available. Yeah. So um, a lot of households have more than one dog or a dog and a cat. You know, there are day, on days that I work for eight or 10 hours, my dogs are home alone. They are not crated. Of course, they're crated when there are puppies until I can trust yeah. them to be loose in the yeah, house here, during yeah. the day. But my dogs are lucky. I have a doggy door and a fenced in backyard yeah. that I am not worried about them getting out of. I live out in the in the country and surrounded by woods. So there are wild animals out here, but I'm not worried about wild animals getting into the fenced yard. Yeah. I don't know how much time my dogs spend outside versus inside when I'm not home. I know when I am home, like right now, my dogs are fast asleep in their dog beds. I have three yeah. three dog beds in my den, so they get to choose where they, they sleep. They always are in the den with me when I'm here because they like to be around me. So right now they're sleeping because there's nothing else for them to do. They don't have to go looking for their own food. They don't have to go looking for a safe place to stay. But I agree with you. I mean, a, a dog that's home alone eight or 10 hours a day is that cruel? Is that okay? It's what they're used to. They don't know any different. So if they don't know any yeah. different, is it okay? Yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting question in and of itself. 
if you don't know any different, does that mean you can't be unhappy about the life you have? Well, that's a good question. I mean, so and like who if you're defines... a zoo animal who was born in a cage and lives a cage yeah. life and has never been yeah. out in right. running around being free yeah. and is in a pretty small cage, how does that animal feel? I mean, we, I guess we, I guess we can we don't know. know. We could know if we put them in an MRI scanner, I guess. Well, we can also know from their behavior. So a yeah. lot of zoo animals, and even, I would argue even some pet animals have what we call stereotypic behavior. Yeah. That's not normal behavior. I listened to the uh, Lemonade Conference talk you gave, uh, I don't know, was it last year, I think, about free roaming dogs and the five mm -hmm. freedoms, which I thought was an excellent way to address it. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, who defines what normal you know, the freedom to exercise normal behavior. Yeah. What's normal behavior for a pet dog that was, you know, brought into the world very artificially and, right. yeah. uh, you know, went to its new home at eight weeks of age and it's home alone every day for eight hours. If it's lucky, somebody will come take it out for a walk midday. But yeah. I know a lot of dogs don't get that. And that's all it knows. I would have thought the majority of them are actually created. But let's say that's not the case. The majority are not created, but they're free in the house. Yes. Do you think that most of these dogs have someone who comes and checks in on them or takes them on a little outing once a day? Or is that rare? Uh, you know, again, you know? I have no data. Yeah. I have no data on that. I think some dogs do get that, especially mm -hmm. when they're young or so if they have to be created. But if they're not created anymore and they can go eight hours without having to go outside... Yeah. That's what they know, but they're with the owners, you know, all the time when hopefully, I mean, again, yeah. some people shouldn't have dogs because they can't spend any time with them, yeah. but they're with the owners in the morning. They're with the owners in the evening. They might be perfectly happy uh, yeah. just being with the owners those times. And then I'll ask you the same question about free roaming dogs. How much of their time is spent actually doing something versus just sleeping or resting? Yeah. Little time is spent actually doing something. Oh, um, most of them, they're just yeah. laying most in of the, the sun. Or... Just, yeah, exactly. They're most active in the morning and in the evening, at least in climate zones that are similar to where I am. So that cooler hours of the day, that's when they walk around, explore, socialize, scavenge. And then in the hotter hours of the day, they usually, they sleep somewhere. I think for me, like part of it is just the option to be able to choose where you want to go and when you want to go. Maybe that's a very anthropocentric view that dogs don't actually care about. Yeah, there's no way to know. Yeah, it, it is anthro anthropomorphic. Yeah. You, you're right. thinking what you would want to do and you yes. think the dog should want to do that too. Right. Um, As I was thinking about this, I realized after our written conversation the other day, I realized the reason I feel strongly about free roaming dogs generally having a pretty good life is because of the things I value in my own life. For being honest, it has nothing to do with what a dog would value in their life or if they even value, air quotes, you can't see, dear listener. <laughs> um, like, do dogs I can say value that. <laughs> things? I don't know. Like, who knows? So my definition of an average free roamer is really hard to define. I've observed them in various parts of Central and South America and in Thailand. So these are two small slices of the world at large. And I've read a lot about them in all kinds of places. But obviously a large part of their life quality will depend on where they live. Here, just like temperature wise, the, the kind of climate I personally prefer is a tropical mountain climate. It's spring like year round. The free roaming dogs, if they don't get to be inside the house, that's okay because they're not cold and they're not hot. But if you were a free roaming dog in Antarctica, that would be very yeah, different, I, right? <laughs> I, I've been there too, and I did not see any free roaming dogs. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a reason for that. That's right. Yeah. But, but yeah, again, are there free roaming dogs in cold climates? I don't know. It's thinking. interesting, like, because the studies yeah. that I have looked at, those are mostly observational studies. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there yeah. are very relatively few studies out there, I think, because the problem is that up until recently, or maybe still today, the domestic dog is not considered an animal worth studying, because it's considered a an artifact that we humans created. So there are all these studies about the life cycles of wild animals, but right. only relatively yeah. few about domestic dogs. We know the life cycle of domestic dogs because we control everything about it. 
Um, right, but that is that is a different kind of like studying them in their natural environment is hard because like what is their natural environment? I might argue that their natural environment is not the, the household, the human household. Well, That's I would true. argue that it is because mm -hmm. without the household, those dogs would not exist. Now, you know, we're not talking about stray dogs and, and dogs that result from accidental litters that end up in shelters. That's a whole nother topic, you know, the life of a shelter dog. Mm -hmm. You know, having just spent two days last weekend at a, a shelter medicine conference, the topic of this conference was basically behavior and how, mm -hmm. you know, how they express their behavior at a, at a shelter. What can we do to facilitate as much natural behavior as possible? If we know what natural behavior is. Right. So again, there is another population of dogs. I don't consider those pet dogs. Shelter dogs yeah. are not yet pet dogs, but pet dogs, what is their natural behavior? It's, right. You know, for my dogs, their natural behavior is going for walks when I go for walks, training when I train them, sleeping when I'm not doing anything with them. So you said something early and I agree 100%. Their behavior is 100% controlled by what I do. Yeah. You also said something about research. I did not want to do a lot of reading on the subject of free roaming dog before I talked to you, but I did take a peek on the veterinary website that I use um, and there are over a hundred papers within mm -hmm. the last 10 years on free roaming dogs and various aspects of their health and behavior. I read the abstract of one article. They compared two free roaming dog populations in two different countries mm -hmm. with farm dogs in Switzerland that were allowed to run yes, free. I, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I rem I, like, I've read that paper too. Seen that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, the thing that I found interesting, and, and again, we talked about this uh, is that there are two parts of the day where the dogs are active, whether they're free roaming or farm dogs. And that's two hours in the morning. I think it was seven to 9 a.m. And then two hours in the afternoon, evening. Mm -hmm. I think it was like four to six. Yeah. I did not read the whole paper, so I don't know the details. But whether they're pet dogs or free roaming dogs, they're not doing something all day, every day, like no, most people no. are. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And if they had a choice, if my dogs had a choice to do anything they wanted, I have no idea what they would choose because yeah. they have never had that choice. Yeah. And seem perfectly content to not have that choice. Right. So because, who's, yeah. Because your dogs are not average pet dogs and you are making sure, like, in my opinion, I'm assuming that you're meeting their needs. So they're content yes. in a <laughs> controlled environment. The average pet dog maybe is still in a controlled environment, but not getting their needs, needs met. Uh, I agree with you mm -hmm. on that. And that's one reason, if you listen to the behaviorists, that's one reason there's a lot of behavior issues in dogs, yeah. because we take dogs that have certain needs. And again, the needs depend on the breed. Yeah. I think you would agree with that. And they're not getting their needs met. Yeah, yeah. So some dogs because of their breed or their temperament are fine with not getting a lot of exercise. And some dogs are not so good yeah. with not getting exercise or their mental needs met yeah. or proper diet. Yeah, you could argue that a lot of dogs are not getting their needs met. But does it matter if the owners are perfectly happy with their behavior and the dog yeah. is quote unquote well taken care of? Yeah. Does it matter if their yeah. needs are not met? I would say it doesn't <laughs> matter, but that is again obviously an opinion. Yeah. Um, one thing you said uh, earlier is that you think of what the dogs don't have, and I think of what the dogs yeah. do have. Yeah. And, and one thing, because obviously I'm a veterinarian, I know that there are a lot of uh, medical issues that dogs can have that you cannot see. So if yeah. a dog is really, really thin, you can yeah. see that and you think, oh, that dog's not getting enough food. Well, um, let me just, ahead. can I briefly yeah. interrupt you? Yeah. I think people usually think of free roaming dogs as dogs who don't have a home. From my observations, that is not true. The free roaming dogs I've seen, or I see around here, they usually do have a home. They have people. They just, they're just free to come and go. So, so they are getting fed enough. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're usually, yeah. so if a dog is extremely thin, this is something I rarely see. And if I do see it, then, I mean, it's obvious to me, either that dog is, it's probably a sick dog or it is truly a feral dog because that's the difference. A feral dog is not a typical free roaming dog either. The free roaming dogs I know and interact with, they all have families. They have people who love them. They just don't love them in the Western culture kind of way. And I'm assuming like, like there's this paper about free roaming dogs in Baltimore from I think the 70s. So it's not that long ago. 
the dogs were even in the US, for example, there were lots of free roaming dogs. It has just rapidly shifted now. Yes, so, it has rapidly shifted. Because uh, I agree with you, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, we didn't let our dogs out loose, but a lot of people just opened the door to let their dogs yeah. out and they wandered around the neighborhood and then they came home at night. That's what, to yeah. me, the typical free roaming dog is. They may not necessarily sleep in the house, but they usually have, they have shelter and they have a place where they go back to at night and sleep. That may be inside the house or it may be a dog house, like right outside the house. But they usually have a place where they can hide from the rain, for example, or see shade from the sun. They belong somewhere. And the people who put out that doghouse would say, this is my dog. Yeah. And sometimes um, more than one person will, would say that because these dogs, they have friends because they sometimes follow one around for a while and just to see. So they have their routines. So that dog may wake up in their doghouse at... I don't know, let's say it's 7 a.m. And the owner will like put a bunch of, uh, of cheap kibble in front of them. So the dog will have their first breakfast. And maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a brief interaction with the owner, if you want to call it that. And then the dog will go about their day. So they will take a stroll to, the, to this other house where they know they will get a little snack because they do every day. This person may also be thinking of this dog as their dog. And then maybe they'll sleep uh, or maybe this other person will open their door to them and they will come in and just hang out for a little bit. And then they keep wandering off and know that at, at noon, there's always this taco stand at the corner <laughs> and <laughs> they'll just pass by there. And the taco person who knows the dog will cut them a slice of meat. So most of the free roaming dogs I see, they're definitely... Some of them would, I would call overweight. My dog is athletic at an athletic weight and definitely thinner than the average free roaming dog that I see. Obviously, I can only, only speak to the dogs in the places where I have observed them myself in that respect. I know it's different in some other countries that I have not visited, so I have less observational data there. But for example, here in Guanajuato, as well as in Antigua and Guatemala, there are also people who will put out food at different spots in town. It's usually kibble and sometimes it's there all day because the dogs just don't eat it because they have something better. <laughs> yeah, because taco meat is better than kibble. Yeah, they have choices that, uh, that the average pet dog doesn't have. And there are yeah. water containers all over town. Small businesses often do that. They will put a water container out um, right outside, both for people with pet dogs. So they'll walk by and stop because their dog will have a drink. And mm -hmm. for the free roaming dogs, I feel like their food and water needs are generally being met. Their needs for shelter are generally being met. And the freedom to express normal behavior, whatever that is for them, is also being met because they make friends with people and with other dogs. And they usually, they're usually extremely good communicators. You don't usually see dogs fighting because fighting is an expensive behavior. I feel like in the pet dog population, there's a higher... Like injuries due to dog fights happen much more frequently. And that's probably partly of the selective pressure. Like we don't select for sociability or not to the degree that maybe we should or could. And partly because of leashes and walking dogs on leashes, leashes don't allow them to communicate freely the way that yeah. free roamers do. Yeah, um, I, I can't argue with anything yeah. that you say, but I'll offer a different point of view. But again, as I, I said earlier, is when I was saying, if you see a very, very thin dog, you might think it's not getting enough to eat. And then you said most free roaming dogs are owned. And I think that's important distinction between free roaming and feral. And when I yeah. see a group, a group of dogs, if I'm traveling and I'm only in a place for a few days or a yeah. week or so, I, I don't know anything about those dogs. I don't know if they are feral or free roaming. Yeah. But what I was going to say, if you see a dog that's very thin, there's really no way to know if that dog's not getting enough to eat or if that dog has a medical problem that's not allowing it yeah. to absorb the yeah. nutrients it needs. It's very likely the latter. I would assume uh -huh. that it's a medical problem or it's a feral dog who has too much of a flight distance to access yeah. the food sources that are available to free roaming dogs. Right. Because and there's so no lack, like in urban spaces like this one, there's no lack of food sources. Right. So um, I'm thinking it's a medical problem. Yeah. 
Uh, and then what other medical problems are we not seeing? Uh, like the dog that you mentioned at the beginning with a broken leg or a dislocated elbow joint. Mm -hmm. um, that was a pet dog. It would either get medical attention or it would be euthanized. So it would not yeah. be left to, and again, air quotes, suffer. Yeah, uh, that dog in the video didn't look like it was suffering. Yeah, it yeah, yeah. Looked like it just had a dangling leg and oh, I can't use this leg. Oh, I guess that's how things are now. So I don't think yeah. dogs sit around feeling sorry for themselves because they have an injury. Also but, in that video, that dog was being, was busy barking. So probably experiencing a spike in adrenaline and not like, I mean, at that moment, probably not feeling the chronic pain that he might right. be feeling otherwise. Yeah. And if he has chronic pain and he just says, well, this is just how things are now. And, and he's not thinking, oh my God, it hurts. I wish I had some pain meds. I yeah. wish somebody could give me that dogs. I don't think they think that they just yeah. go, oh, this is how things are now. And I have seen pet dogs come into the clinic, having been hit by a car with a, a fracture, hopping in on three legs, wagging their tails, greeting everybody, seemingly perfectly happy and not, wow. not in pain. That's and crazy. I've seen, I know it. I mean, until you see it, you think, oh my God, this dog is impossible. <laughs> it's got a broken leg or it's got this huge wound. It's like, oh, it's wagging his tail and saying hi to everybody. Uh, and then I've seen, you know, dogs come in screaming in pain for, you know, various reasons. And then the first thing we need to address is getting some pain meds on board yeah. to, to relieve the pain. Uh, and free roaming dogs, as well as feral dogs, but we're not talking about that. If they get hit by a car, and are killed, does the owner ever know that? I mean, is it, what if the dog is hit by a car and crawls into the bushes and dies back there? Does yeah. anybody ever know? Or does the owner say, oh, he didn't come home today. I don't know what happened. And um, are, I, yeah. are they sad? And the dog yeah. that you saw with the big wound, I mean, did that dog get medical care? Does it matter? Yeah, I don't know. Like the wound, the first time I saw it, it had a bandage, like there was a bandage and okay, then it was so gone. It but I must, that, that may just have been something that the owner put on the dog. So right. I don't know. Right. But, but again, you can argue, well, does it matter? That dog healed yeah. and, and did fine that dog, with, yeah. with a lot, yeah, with a lot less expense. And it yeah. would have cost, uh, if I had seen that wound and was treating that dog, it would have taken weeks and weeks to treat it. And it would have cost the owner probably thousands of dollars. How, how much would it have cost the owner? I'm curious. Well, thousands, because you're seeing them, if you're bandaging it, you're seeing them frequently, if you're changing the bandage, and sometimes you have to sedate them to change the bandage, because they won't tolerate letting you do it, so that adds an expense, oh, uh, and it depends where the course. wound is, sometimes you have to debride it, which means surgically removing the dead tissue to facilitate healing, so yeah, yeah I mean, when you're treating a, a um, a huge laceration or an open wound, it's, it's a long process, and it's expensive. So this dog, for example, was this dog lucky to get the granulation tissue? Or is that what usually happens if you don't intervene? That's the normal tissue healing. But if I had a dog come in to my clinic with a wound that size, and I said, oh, let's just clip it and clean it and it'll heal, the owner would go to another vet because they would think I'm incompetent. And I've treated lots of wounds where there's these huge open wounds and they fill in with granulation tissue. And sometimes we just allow them to heal on their own like that, but, you know, keeping them clean and using antibiotics as needed. Yeah. yeah and yeah. sometimes then we get to a point where we then do a surgical closure. So once we get the wound to a point where we think we can get skin to skin healing, then we close the wound. But like I said, in mm -hmm. Western practice, an owner would go to another vet if I told them, no, we don't need to treat it. It will heal in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But then you have a population of, of dogs that are owned by people that cannot afford much veterinary care. Yeah. So in that case, I would see the dog. I would clip the fur, clean the wound and say, okay, just keep him from chewing at it. Try to keep it as clean and dry as possible and it should heal. Yeah. Because if they don't have the option of paying for veterinary care, I would rather do that than say, oh, we have to put your dog to sleep. Oh, of course. Yeah. And you give them pain meds. I give them pain meds. But after a while, it's, it's probably not painful. So... The average pet owner who comes to your practice or used to come to your practice, well, I guess you didn't have a practice for average pets. 
But um, so you wouldn't give them the option of not spending a thousand dollars in the first place, or do you like tell them, you know, let me be pragmatic with you. There are two options. One is going to cost you like this much, and the other one is going to cost you this much. No, I often do. Not, I mean, with any illness, I I, I tell people. Yeah. So we we could do the the cheap version, and I don't mean that disparagingly, but yes, I do give them options because veterinary care is expensive. And I understand that not everybody can afford to spend thousands of dollars, like a dog with a cruciate ligament tear. I always tell the owners, your option is medical treatment or surgical treatment. And I tell them the advantages and disadvantages and the cost yeah. of each, and then they make a decision what they want to do. There are, certain, there are some diseases that you don't have a choice. Like if your dog has diabetes and you don't treat them with insulin, they're going to die. Yeah. But the dog's not going to die from a torn cruciate, okay? Now, if the dog has a fracture, then there are some fractures that might heal if you stick them in a cage for six or eight weeks, stick them in a crate, and it might heal. It might heal wrong, mm -hmm. like the dog with a dangly leg in your video. If that's a fracture, that fracture is going to heal, but it won't heal normally. Yeah, I'm assuming this is already an old injury because there was fur all over the... Well, but if there's a fracture, they're not going to lose fur. If he was hit by a car... But wouldn't you see bruising and, and like... Not necessarily. You would see bruising and swelling if you saw it within the first several days, but then the bruising goes away and the swelling goes down uh, and all you see is a dangling leg. As a veterinarian, I give the owner options, explain the advantages and disadvantages of each option. So with this dog, for example, the dog with the dangling leg, if that dog came in, would you tell the owner there's an expensive surgical option or yes. we can put that dog to sleep or is there a third option? The third option is to amputate the leg, which might be a little less expensive than surgically repairing the leg. Because if it's a fracture and you surgically repair it, then you have to follow up with x-rays to see if it's healing. And sometimes you put pins in. Yeah. So you would not, the chronic pain this dog is likely to experience is an amount of pain that you would not consider acceptable. So you would put that dog to sleep if the owner was not going to go with one of the other options? No, I mean, that's up to the owner. It's not my decision. Yeah, yeah. If it was my dog, they would get X immediately. They would get x-rays. Right. But again, there are options. If, if you have a dog with a fracture, do you want to do surgical repair to put a plate on or pins and screws? Or do you want to put it in a cast and hope it heals? And there are issues with dealing mm -hmm. with the cast. They have to be changed regularly. Uh, if they get wet, you have to change it immediately. You have to sedate the dog. So there are advantages yeah. and disadvantages of of different medical options, but at least most pet dog owners are given those options and make a decision. Yeah. The yeah. option that's not acceptable to me is no pain control. Yeah. But if an owner wants to take the dog home with a broken leg, and I've had owners do that, I've had owners take dogs and cats home that, that need medical care. Mm -hmm. And they say, nope, not doing it. But they did come in in the first place. So they, they came in because they didn't know how expensive it was going to be. Or, yeah. Yes, it's usually money. That's yeah. the obstacle, which is a hard part about being a veterinarian. I mean, they might have enough money to get some pain meds mm -hmm. and they might have enough money to euthanize dogs, but that animal's not going to get treated yeah. until you, you sign a release form and you leave a deposit. And people think, well, that's cruel, but that, that's how it is. Unless you have pet insurance. So these injuries, the two that we talked about, they were obvious, right? Yeah. They were obvious to me and they're obvious to their owner um, and their owners. I mean, I'm assuming the reason the owners are unlikely to take a dog like this to the vet is uh, financial and also cultural and maybe lack of knowledge. So what other conditions... So you've watched, for example, my lemonade presentation, which had a couple of clips of free roaming dogs in them, mm -hmm. who I think mostly looked well fed. What invisible medical problems might those dogs have that I don't see? The, uh, the first one I think of is endoparasites, so intestinal worms. Mm -hmm. But again, a, a healthy adult dog can have a, a worm burden and it's not going to cause much problems, okay? Ectoparasites, fleas, and ticks. Yeah. Uh, and again, most of those are just a nuisance to the dog. But if the dog is not healthy or the dog is small, especially puppies, but 
we're not talking about puppies, then fleas and ticks can cause anemia. Oh, really? Yeah, if they suck enough blood. When I was in practice in California, and this was before there were these topical treatments for fleas and ticks and oral treatments for fleas and ticks, I saw a lot of anemic dogs because they had such a heavy burden of fleas. Wow. Most, yeah, most yeah. puppies and kittens and young dogs or sick dogs. But yes, I have seen dogs die from anemia because of the flea load. So wow. yeah. uh, I don't know how common that is in free roaming dogs. I guess it depends on where they are. They can have endocrine diseases like diabetes. Uh, if they're free roaming, is the owner going to know if this dog is drinking a lot of water and peeing a lot? Because no. those are the first signs that, that owners see with dogs that have diabetes or Cushing's disease. They're drinking a lot of water and they're peeing a lot, mm. but you, uh, you wouldn't know that from a free roaming dog. You, right. wouldn't no, know, you, wouldn't know. Uh, you would not know if a free roaming dog is not eating the normal amount, because if it didn't eat the kibble, you would think, oh, it ate, you know, somewhere else during the yeah. day. You so, only know once the dog starts getting thinner and thinner. Yes. Or once the dog starts showing other clinical signs. Yeah. I would argue that with free roaming dogs, there are medical conditions that would be treated later than they would be yeah. uh, in a, a pet dog or not treated at all, whether the owner knew about it or not. So is diabetes, for example, or Cushing's disease, are those common issues or is that uh, something that's relatively rare? No, they're pretty common. Um, yeah. I, I don't have numbers as to percentage of dogs that get them, but there are a percentage of dogs that get them. And I don't know if the free roaming population is any different from the pet population. Yeah, it would be interesting because yeah. I mean, though, most of those dogs are mixed breed or mixed breed or no breed at all. So maybe there's some hybrid vigor going on or is that? Yeah, not, I think hybrid I vigor is a myth. <laughs> It's a myth. Because okay. Yeah. I think so. We see we see the same diseases that we see in purebreds and mixed breeds. And again, I, mm -hmm. I don't I don't have the data for every yeah. every disease and every breed. But um, you know, we see we see torn cruciates and mixed breed dogs as well as purebred yeah. dogs. Yeah, yeah. And fractures, you know, hit by car doesn't discriminate. But that that obviously does not discriminate. Yet. That yeah. for me, for example, is one of the biggest differences of life quality. If you live in the center of Guanajuato, mm -hmm. the town I'm in now, it's a pedestrian city. There are hardly any cars because it mostly has these small alleyways, these callejones. Yeah. And it's safe to be a free roaming dog there. Yeah. It's, or it's very unlikely that it will be hit by a car because you may never in your life cross a street that has cars on it. And Or if you do, those are cobblestone streets and there are lots of pedestrians walking too. So the cars are extremely slow. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it's very, it's relatively unlikely that you'll be hit by a car. And I walked my dog off leash there all the time, like right out of my house. Yeah. Because... Yeah. Because yeah. cars are a huge danger. Where right. I live now, in the outskirts of the same city, there's a freeway-like street kind of next to my house. And I can't go out of the house with game of leash because I'm afraid when I'm crossing the street mm -hmm. myself. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. And I know about traffic. And like in, in the first two weeks that I've lived here, I've seen personally three accidents. Mm. So like, this is insane. Like, I'm, that just... Yeah. So being a free roaming dog here is a very different experience. Mm -hmm. And a much more dangerous one than being a free roaming dog in a very pedestrian place. Do you think free roaming dogs learn the dangers of cars? Well, they either learn or they get, or they die. Or they die. Yeah. Yeah. So the ones I, like I've seen, it's interesting. Like you see those dogs who who always only stay on their side of the street and they won't step onto the street. So they know obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They won't cross or they use the pedestrian bridges. Yeah. But, and I see, because I see free roaming dogs here too, but the, there's less population density. And I think that's probably partly because more dogs get run over. And also because there's less food sources out here than there's in the center. The center is densely, more densely populated by people too. Yeah. And, so, and also yeah. owners in the, um, in the area where there's not a lot of traffic might be more comfortable letting their dogs out than, yeah. than yeah. owners who live where it's more urban yeah. with, a, with a lot of traffic because I know my dogs have no idea what a road is and what cars yeah. are and I have to be very careful my dogs yeah. are off leash a lot but not when they're they're around traffic right because, no yeah know. yeah same here there's a couple adult free roamers game and I know now that are really navigating this environment well it's it looks to me but those are probably the one dog out of that litter that got to that age 
because especially when you're a puppy, mortality is extremely high. It's, yeah. I think, well, I wrote it down somewhere. I keep forgetting the numbers. There's like 19% of puppies of free roaming dogs that even make it to reproductive age. So that's a yeah. really, that's a small number. Right. Because and, is that and because the, they're not born at the owner's house? Where I mean, where are they born and where do they live? Because once the mother has a litter of puppies, she can't be going back and forth to her house from wherever the yeah. puppies are. I think most of them are born at their house. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm now specifically thinking of one example, which obviously is not representative. Yeah, right, at all. but it's better but, than um, nothing. My, my neighbors, when I lived in the center, they had free roaming dogs. And one of the, um, one of the females had a litter. They were in, the, in that, there was kind of a yard that was shared by several houses. Mm -hmm. And they were in there and the gate was always open. So the dogs could come and go. And the puppies, they stayed inside. So you can see, it's really interesting. It was really interesting for me to observe because humans don't really intervene that much. So you can see the mother making sure that they don't venture too far in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the older they got, the further they were allowed to go and the less she intervened at all. Mm -hmm. When, like initially when I walked by with game and she was close to the door, she would be barking and being really defensive. Mm -hmm. Because I was too close to her puppies, uh, or game was too close to her puppies for her to feel comfortable, which she hadn't done before she had that litter. And the older the puppies got, the less intense the mother got as well. Yeah. But so they were born at their house. They were fed there. There was always kibble. Like mm -hmm. I could see that the huge pile of kibble, more than they would eat. Yeah. Um, kibble, like there's really cheap kibble here, which I mean, I'm assuming that just it consists of corn and little else. Whatever, like they get something to eat. And so th those puppies were born at home, mm -hmm. but also like I, um, I borrowed one of these puppies for 10 days. <laughs> borrowed it, huh? <laughs> uh -huh. No, borrowed is in, I, so the, the, the people who had the adult dogs, they know me uh -huh. because I walk past with my dog and I sometimes stop and chat with them. Uh -huh. And when they had the puppies, I was like, oh, your puppies are so cute. <laughs> and, and <laughs> He, uh, so this guy was like, well, do you want one? And I'm like, well, I wish I could, but well, I couldn't. It wasn't the time. Yeah. It's like, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could, but I can't right now. But later at some point, so we kept talking sometimes about the puppies, about random things. He knew I was a dog trainer and was taking videos um, for online classes of my own dog. And um, at one point I was like, hmm, what if I... Maybe he'll lend me one of the puppies so I can take some puppy videos. And I'm, I'm currently working towards my control unleashed um, uh -huh. trainer certification. Yep. And I thought it would be fun to like have a couple, train a few of the games I need to submit with the puppy. Uh -huh. um, so I asked him, I told him, man, like they're so cute and I would love to, I wish I had the, like, I was in a place where I could take one of your puppies, but I can't right now. But um, would you would you lend me one for like a week? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, "Sure, just How old take was one." It? How old was it at that um, time? Um, like eight weeks. Uh -huh. So yeah. I made sure to take the puppy at the time that I would take a, a dog mm -hmm. in any other like if I got it from a breeder. Right. Um. So I said, "Okay, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll bring her back in <laughs> a week." And I mean, he may have been hoping, like he said, well, but if you want to, you can keep her too. Yeah. So I think he probably hoped that I would keep her. But. Yeah. So, so in, in that case, I mean, do, do those people then find homes for the puppies or do they just become part of their... Um, um, so I, I also asked him because I was, in, I was curious and I had a relationship with that person. So we could talk about these things. Um, and yeah, they were trying to find homes for the mm -hmm. puppies. Um, but very casually, yeah. Like by, you know, like just telling people that they had a litter, and there were puppies available, and one of them got like the neighbors uh, got one of them, but it just kept coming back. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that's where it lived. <laughs> that's where it was born, and that's where it <laughs> felt at home. And the neighbors were also keeping the puppy right from the start as a free roaming dog. Yeah. 
So the neighbors had to keep coming back to get their puppies. <laughs> <laughs> and then they'd let it out again the next day and it would be Yeah, bad. of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is kind of funny. But so the, the, the puppy I had for 10 days, so I de, like I dewarmed her and I defleed her um, because she had, and I think all, like, I guess all puppies have worms, right? Well, if the so parents, she, she had, if the mother does, the puppies do. Yeah. So she had uh, tapeworms that- mm -hmm. That's from the and, fleas. Yeah. Um, so I defleed her, dewarmed her, but felt like that is that was the level, because it's not my dog. I had worried, I didn't want to do anything more yeah. intrusive than that. That didn't feel like my place. Yeah. What about but vaccines? I, um, are they commonly given in, in the area where you live? Um, so there are rabies vaccine campaigns that are very common, I think, in Mexico in general. Uh -huh. As for other vaccines, I don't think um, there are campaigns for that. So it would depend on the on the person. And I, I assume it's unlikely that the puppy right. or, or that the dogs would get, like most dogs are probably unvaccinated. Yeah. As far, but, like they're probably vaccinated against rabies, but not against anything else. Okay. It's, well, it's my assumption, but I, yeah, I don't have data on that. No, I, I, I don't know if anybody does. I would argue that most pet dog owners don't let their dogs loose because they're afraid something will happen to them. Yeah. I mean, that's why I don't let my dogs. I have a fenced yard and I, I don't live close to a road. Well, I mean, it's, it's about a tenth of a mile away, the main highway, uh, the main two lane road with a 55 yeah. mile per hour speed limit. But I live in the middle of the woods and I could let my dogs uh, out to just true. wander the woods at their heart's content. But I'm afraid mm -hmm. they'll never come back or something will yeah. happen to them. I mean, they'd come back if they could because I think they're pretty good about finding their home. But right, I, they have their beagles. They have good yeah, noses. Yeah. I, I would be afraid something would happen to them or they would get to a point where they can't find their way home and then they might wander close to the road. Yeah. Um, but I... That makes me think my next door neighbor, and, and again, I have 30 acres and she has 60 acres and the neighbor on the other side has 20 something acres. So oh, man, it's, so it's nice. not, it's yeah, it's not an urban area. It's not like a street in a town. We're yeah. out in the country. Um, yeah. But they, when I bought my house, this was 14 years ago, they had a dog about a five or six year old dog, mixed breed, middle size, 50 pound dog that was free roaming. So they would yeah. let cider out all day. And I would see her sometimes crossing the highway with cars going really fast, making yeah. the cars swerve or break. And I would cringe. Yeah. And yeah, but they're the owners. They didn't. Well, they didn't care enough to keep her confined because they think they thought keeping her confined was cruel. Yeah. Um, so she would, you know, wander. I don't know what she did. I just saw yeah. her often around her on her property, but often up the road across the street from us. And she, you know, died of old age of natural causes. Yeah. She didn't ever got hit by a car yeah. or injured. But that it, it would bother me more than it would bother yeah. their the owners. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot more people would let their dogs roam free if it was legal. Uh, yeah. But I think most people don't because they're afraid what will happen. Because we love our pets. Uh, yeah, and we don't want anything bad to happen to them. Yeah, I mean, so of those um, of those dogs who do die, um, there's that that's a, a study that has been done in India in 2016, I think. Um, and over 60 percent of the deaths, if I I hope I'm remembering the I link to the study in the show notes, but I hope I remember the the numbers correctly. Over 60 percent of those deaths are human influence so it's us like we are the problem here right yeah um and that's yeah. car accidents which mm -hmm. i'm assuming is pretty high up like depending on where you live mm -hmm. um or in in some countries where it is assumed that there's an overpopulation of free roaming dogs there are systematic killings of dogs um, so that people shoot them is that how yeah, they kill or, them? or that the government has a like makes a, a campaign to to put all the free roaming dogs they can find to sleep so they have to catch them first. Yeah, they have to catch them first, but they are not, they're not shy. So, right. it's so not they just they would be hard to catch. So they just take them and put them to sleep without yeah, without regard to if somebody owns them and loves yeah. them. Like oh, that yeah. is not the case in my part of the world. Uh -huh. Um like I think that is the case in places where 
and usually because people are thinking of dogs as a, a rabies carrying yeah. species yes. and yeah. as a pest that needs to be controlled. Yes. Yeah. And in some cases, both are true. I mean, it, yeah. it's, it's true that they carry rabies and they can spread other diseases. There are some internal parasites that dogs get that people can get. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want loose dogs roaming over my property, peeing and pooping everywhere. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, in exposing my dogs to infectious diseases. Yeah, I mean, I vaccinate, I Prevecto, I mm -hmm. like yes. the chemical stuff. <laughs> Thank goodness for Prevecto. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I'm like, because game has contact to free roaming dogs right. and, mm -hmm. and to their uh, poop that nobody pe picks up, obviously. Right. Like and she doesn't eat it, but she sniffs it. And I, yes. I just want to be... Yeah. She also sleeps in my bed. Yeah. So right. I want to be as safe from these parasites as possible. Right. And she she has close contact with free roaming dogs. So you want her yeah. protected against infectious diseases like distemper yeah. and parvovirus. You know, same with me. I, I vaccinate my dogs. I They don't come in contact with free roaming dogs. Uh, and most of the dogs they come in contact with are owned and well taken care of. But yeah. I do check them for parasites once in a while. Yeah. Uh, I treat them for heartworm every month. To yeah, prevent too, heartworm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, heartworm is another disease that can kill dogs and you would not notice any clinical signs until the very end. So yeah. I don't know how common that is where you live, but it's- I mean, I know it is because I looked at like in Austria, where I'm from, that's not a thing. There are no, apparently there are no- Right. And heartworms there's- are not yet. I guess it has to do with climatic conditions. Yes, it has to do with climate. And there are parts of the United States where heartworm is not common. Yeah, uh, but all it takes is one infected mosquito to bite your dog to transmit yeah. the disease. So, so any anytime I go somewhere new, I look up what parasites there are common, so what I need to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, when I when I went to the U.S. with my dogs, they got to California. They got heartworm treatments yep. throughout that time. When I moved to yeah, and obviously in Thailand and here too, they're on all these. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, when I think about whether pets or free roaming dogs are better off, I, of course, think a lot about medical care, yeah. uh, treatment and prevention of injuries and illness. So I think pet dogs are better off in that aspect. As far as activity, I would concede that free roaming dogs are better off in that aspect mm -hmm. uh, compared to the average pet dog, compared to yeah. performance dogs. Um, yeah, maybe, that's different. maybe, yeah, that's different. Uh, so I think um, it really depends on your opinion. Opinion is like you said, yeah. there's very few studies that compare the two. And then, as you also said, when you talked about the five freedoms, who decides what those freedoms are? I mean, the definition yeah. of those freedoms. Yeah, that they're so like the terms, they don't really mean anything. That they're vague. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so again, we have what we have mostly opinion, which yeah. is neither right nor wrong. And yeah, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Now that I've talked to you, I do agree that in terms of access to medi me um, medical care, mm -hmm. the average pet dog is probably better off. Yep. I still like, I don't know <laughs> if <laughs> I think that personally, and I feel like really part of the reason that I'm such a fan of the free roaming dogs life is that it's like a very human reason is that I, if you, if I, if someone put a gun to my head and said, you have to be a dog now pick if you want to be a pet dog or a free roaming dog, I would of course choose the free roaming life. And because... I would choose the pet life. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> because I see, I see how pampered pets are. Yeah, um... but I don't like, I, I don't know if you have that saying in English, in, in German, there's a saying that the, to the bird, that the simple branch is worth more than the golden cage. And I, I feel that so strongly as a human, mm -hmm. as myself, yeah. like I've left the golden cage of Austria to live in a part of the world where there are less cages. Yeah. Like some people would consider these parts of the world more dangerous too. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, it's not a question. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to live. And that's how I want to live. Yeah. Because for me, it's a life quality thing. And I feel like my life quality is higher here, even though I'm not, like I wouldn't have the same access to medical care here that I have in Austria. Austria right. has great medical care. Yeah. Um, and everyone great gets it. Veterinary care. And so, great veterinary care. So if your dog was hit by a car, I would fly to you. I mean, <laughs> that would be a problem because no, because I wouldn't be allowed to board this stupid flight. So I don't know what I would do. I would drive. 
that's yeah. very far. So uh, <laughs> again, there, you know what? There's advantages and disadvantages of everything, yeah. risks and benefits, and every individual has to benefit have to balance the risks versus benefits yeah. and make the decision that's best for you. And that's why I always yeah. say to clients, there's no right or wrong, there's no better or worse, there's no good or bad. There's only what's best for you or your dog. And if it's best for you, for whatever reason, to euthanize your dog, I don't have a problem with that. No, um, me neither, because I feel like once the dog, the dog is no longer in pain once it's right. euthanized. It's no so longer there's suffering. No, there's no welfare issue there. Yeah. Right. Uh, and to me, yeah. the most important thing is I don't want my dogs or anybody else's dog to suffer. Um, yeah, I'm with you there. Yeah. So, but, well, let me ask you a question. Would you, why don't you let game out to free roam? When yeah. You, when you lived in the area that was safer from cars, did you, yeah. why did you not let game out? Because I'm afraid that someone would take her. Mm -hmm. um, either, I mean, probably not my neighbors, but the tourists. Mm. Um, it's a it's a cultural city, so you get tourists. Yeah. I mean, they usually don't go up the Callejones because they're afraid that they'll be robbed. <laughs> where you live, but, but I mean, sometimes someone gets lost there yeah. and they will see a purebred dog and mm -hmm. they will think, this is a lost dog. It obviously like needs help. And yeah. oh my God, look at it. It's thinner than the pet dog I have in the US. It's obviously starving. Ah, um, interesting. They would take yeah. my dog and um, I would never see my dog again. That's yeah. why I don't let her out. Or even if it wasn't that, someone would pick her up for a spay and neuter clinic and neuter my dog and I want my I don't want my dog to be <laughs> yeah yeah so that's why otherwise mm -hmm. I would like it's yeah. the humans that I don't trust in this respect mm -hmm. and a lot of the humans I don't trust are foreigners yeah who do not share the cultural values of that area or they might just say I I, I think this dog has no home and is is yeah. suffering or my and like, I want to yeah, say I want to rescue yeah, yeah, yeah. her yeah that's okay. what people like that's what people who haven't coexisted in a space with free roaming dogs usually assume they yeah. assume the dog doesn't have a home uh -huh. and they want to rescue it but the people that live there and know better just assume this dog is well taken yeah. care of and, and not a problem i don't need to do anything right yeah that's usually yeah. the case even, so even that, the yeah the dogs that you saw that were you knew that there's nothing you can or should do anyway Right. No, I mean, I'm not someone that's also an opinion, but like, it's not my place. Like this is someone's dog. Mm -hmm. It's not my place to make the decision for them. What, right. Whether that dog goes to the vet or not. Right. Um, yeah, I yeah. agree. Let me just add one thing to the, why wouldn't I let my dog roam free? Uh -huh. So that puppy that I talked to you about that I borrowed for 10 days and I socialized her and trained her and I was actually talking to Shade at that point because she was looking for a dog for one of her clients who would make a good pet dog. And we were considering, I didn't want to keep her for more than that time because she was probably going to be a free roamer. But the moment that her client would have committed to that puppy, I would have kept the puppy and prepared it further to be a good mm -hmm. pet dog. Mm -hmm. But I, would, I didn't want to keep her any longer than that week because I didn't want her to miss out on the lessons of free roaming life that she would get. Right, right. Yes, they have But to so then the thing is I, I gave her back and I would walk past there almost every day and she would join us for a little bit. I was super happy to see me in game. And then <laughs> like a couple of weeks later, she wasn't there. Oh. And I kept going back because at that point I really had a relationship to that dog and I loved her. And after not seeing her for three days in a row, I asked the owner of the puppies, have you found her home? He said, no, she should be somewhere around here. And then he looked all over the place on the property and he hadn't even realized that she was missing yet. And he was like, oh, no, she's really not here. And she never came back. Oh. So I don't know what happened to her. No, like, who knows? Yeah. I, I mean, somebody, some tourists might've taken her home. Some tourists might've taken her home. Like, I, I mean, we never, there was no body. And yeah, well, but I mean, I'm sure I extended her, her core area just by taking her places. So uh -huh. in the end, I might have contributed to the fact that if she yeah. really ventured all the way to a car street and got run over and the other puppies didn't because they didn't have the experiences I gave this puppy. Mm -hmm. Or if a tourist was walking through that alley, she would have been the first puppy to approach because I facilitated more contact with people than the other puppies uh -huh. probably had. 
Yeah. So then she would be the one who would be taken rather than the others. So I don't know what happened to her. Um, yeah, and that's okay. and that is the reason I think that most pet dog owners in the U.S. don't let their dogs loose. Mm -hmm. I also think it's different in in very rural areas of some states. I bet there are a lot of uh, free roaming dogs. I yeah. just don't see them because I don't yeah. I don't live in that area. But from my experience, when I was in general practice, and even now, in, in the dogs that I see, they're all pets. Um, yeah, they're all pet, even performance dogs. I think most performance dog owners would say they're my pet first and I'm not yeah. even sure if pet is a politically correct word I like anymore. companion companions I think, yeah, yeah like I think a companion dog they are all our companion because it was our choice to yeah. acquire them uh, it was not their choice to come to us yeah and so as much choice as we like to give our dogs we pretty much control their lives yeah. For good or for bad, we control yeah. their lives. I would argue that my dogs are pretty happy with that. No, I'm sure they are. They get the best of both worlds because they do yes. get to run off leash and mm -hmm. use, use yeah. their noses and spend a lot of time with you. And at the same time, they have excellent veterinary care. They mm -hmm. get probably high quality food and they have the comfiest of beds. Yeah. Well, um, my bed. <laughs> yeah. I still like my dog is in a similar position of having yep. the best of both worlds but still when I thought about that further with the gun to my head pick pet dog or free runner uh -huh. I wouldn't even pick my dog's life I would pick the life where I have where I can maximize my own choices but that is yeah, not I mean that is obviously not about dogs at all that's just about me as a person and uh -huh. how strongly I feel about my own personal freedom right yeah, that's interesting. Um, and that colors, uh, that co that obviously colors my view yeah. about all living beings in ways that well, are not, that are entirely subjective. Yeah. You know, that's okay because that's yeah. all we have to base our decisions on. I, I actually have not even thought if I would come back as a pet dog or a free roaming dog, but yeah. if I had a gun to my head, I yeah. would say I want to come back as a pet dog in a performance home. Yeah. So, um, but you know, even most pet homes, I think those dogs are very well taken care of. If you don't, if you don't put your thoughts and feelings yeah. on what they should or shouldn't be doing, I think most of them are quite content with their no, lives. Yeah. No, so, I mean that's anyway. probably true. Yeah. And that's why this discussion was so fun because I yeah. I value your opinion. I find it very interesting, and you make me think about things I hadn't thought of before. So that's good. Yeah, and you give me facts. That is, I, I really, I like that, the fact checking, because for example, with, yeah, when I see an injured dog, like I'll think something about it, but I don't know. Like I just don't mm -hmm. know, have, I don't have the education right. to be able to even have an educated opinion on what right. I'm actually right. seeing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and I, and I want to learn, yeah. like, yeah, I love learning these little, these little things that you have taught me over the last couple of years. <laughs> that's, yeah. That is so valuable to me. Thank you so much for that. I really, really appreciate that. You're welcome. And I, and I always say if, if I have data, I want to base my decisions on data. Yeah. Uh, if I don't have data, your opinion is as good as my opinion. Yeah. Uh, because once it's the, once there's no data, it's just opinions. Right. If people yeah. people choose to see the data and don't accept it. Well, like yeah. that's another story. But uh, yeah. that's for another podcast. Yeah, that would be a very long one. <laughs> Even longer. Yes, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's wrap this one up. Okay. So before we end, do you have any upcoming classes that you would like to plug, or other events, or where people can find you on the internet? Yeah, you cannot find me on the internet because I don't want to be found. So I, mm -hmm. I do have a Facebook page, but I never look at it. I do teach a class for FDSA once a year on canine sports medicine, and that's usually in the April term. Mm -hmm. um, I just gave a webinar on the different options for sterilizing your male and female dogs. And Jessica Heckman and I are going to repeat our webinar and whether you should or should not sterilize your male and female dogs. And we're updating the webinar that we gave in 2019. Okay. And that is sometime in September. I don't have the exact date. Yeah, it should be on the schedule. Okay, so I'll put a link to that on the okay. show notes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's like I'll accept. put links to your class if it's on the schedule and to your... Yeah, it's probably not on the schedule. Yeah. And I also wanted to tell you that I really like the name of your podcast. I, uh, I listened to the first two episodes, so I would uh -huh. have a clue what's going on. I found them both very interesting. 
as somebody who's closer to the end of my life than the beginning of my life, not to be morbid, but that's just how it works. I have had a wild and precious life and I'm very grateful for that. And I, I don't plan to go anywhere anytime soon, except more traveling, but uh, I, hey, I like really have to your come podcast. visit me. I know. I uh, I was listening to Peter talking about the lake, and I'm assuming you, that's in Guatemala. You've seen the lake. lake. Um, that like picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll come visit you there if you go back there. I'll go visit Peter at some point in any case, so we could just go together. Well, you let me know. I, yeah. uh, I'm planning a trip to Scotland next spring, but uh, nice. what, what time of year is the lake the nicest? I would say right after the rainy season, because you still have all the green stuff, but you don't get caught up in surprise, extremely strong rainstorms. I'll check with Peter and I'll get back to you. Yeah, yeah. I'll come have, visit you there. Oh, there's this amazing Airbnb that I've stayed at at the lake. It is so, uh -huh. it's at the lake shore. It's so beautiful. Oh my God, we should totally okay. go there. <laughs> so yeah, well, I'll come to Guatemala. Knowing that you, you, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm okay. I'm, you will come to Guatemala. <laughs> yes, I will. And we'll, and we'll walk around the lake and talk about dogs and anything else we want to talk about. Nice. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sue, for taking the time out of your, you're welcome, your day to, to chat with me. Um, it was a great conversation and I really enjoyed it. And I did too. Yeah. I'll talk to you soon. And also to our dear listener. <laughs> I think there's more than one, Chrissy. <laughs>